So we're going to talk a little bit about normal distributions. We've really set the foundation for this because some important information to know coming into this is, first of all, the scales of measurement. Second of all, the measures of central tendency and dispersion, specifically the mean and the standard deviation. And then, importantly, probability or p-values, because distributions are what allow us to get p-values that is, we can say, what's the probability of observing a particular value because of knowing its position in a distribution? So with that foundational knowledge, we can move into this concept of looking at normal distributions as our first real kind of foray into inferential statistics. So this is not fully inferential yet, but it will serve as the basis for that movement. So when we're dealing with normal distributions, the first thing you need to know is that we're assuming we have a variable that is continuous, right? Which means it's on an interval ratio scale and the data are continuous. And we're assuming that there's some random X value that has these properties, right? So we are not assuming that you're dealing with data that are nominal or data that are ordinal. You wouldn't expect those to form a nice bell shape necessarily. So these are kind of the foundational assumptions because when we turn them into a standard normal distribution, as we'll talk about, we're assuming that they're along this continuum. So why do we care about normal distributions? And it really goes back to the same thing we talked about from our beginning in week one, and why do we care about distributions at all? And I provide this quote from David Howell from the University of Vermont, and it reminds us that if we know something about the distribution of events or of statistics, then we can know something about the probability that those events will occur. And so this allows us to get into probability. This allows us to get into inference. So we can say, oh, that's highly unlikely, and we can know that maybe we should look for an explanation. So this is used across a variety of science. In fact, there is no modern science that doesn't use this. Some interesting examples um, at the CERN Super Collider, where they try to detect new particles, the way that they actually identify a new particle is first by identifying um, patterns in their data that are statistically unlikely to occur. So they often use, you know, the number of standard deviations away to say, oh, wow, that was really unlikely that our models wouldn't have predicted that. So what was the perturbation? What was the difference? What was it that occurred that was unlikely to occur? And that's part of how they go about detecting new particles, right? So those types of things form the foundations. Similarly, if we talk about psychology or health, we might say, well, did my new treatment work? And to decide whether a treatment works, you have to say, well, what is the probability I would observe a certain amount of change, right, if my treatment didn't work? So we have to have some sense of like what would be the expected distribution of some random X variable. And then we just have to say, well, if my observation is part of that distribution, is it likely to occur? And if not, what is the explanation for why it occurred? So if I see a change in depression that is unlikely to occur by chance, I might say, oh, it was probably the result of my intervention. If I see a, a blip in my data regarding the, you know, electromagnetic properties in the CERN super collider, they might infer that perhaps there was a, a particle that wasn't included in their models that caused that difference, right? And so this is the process by which we say, oh my goodness, something was unlikely to happen. Be and we know this because of its location in a distribution. And because it's unlikely to happen, we then ask, well, is there something that explains it's happening? That's often the process or logic that underlies this. Now, when we just focus first on normal distributions, and we'll get more into inference again later, I just want you to understand that, that is the, this is foundational to that process, is distribution, right? But for a normal distribution, the first thing to realize is that all the measures of central tendency are equal. So you see here we have the indication of mu, the mean, is right in the middle of the distribution. But in a normal distribution, where the mean is located is also the median and is also the mode. Right, so you see it's the highest peak in the distribution, which makes it the mode. And you see that it splits the distribution in perfect half, which makes it the median. So in a normal distribution, all measures of central tendency are equal. The normal distribution is this nice bell shape, this Gaussian curve, right? And it is symmetric around the mean, as we just said, right? The total area under the curve, so this is our curve, right? And under this curve, the total area is one, 
And this area on the y-axis would be the probability or the density function, basically how much stuff happens, right? So when you sum up everything under the curve, it's everything that could happen. So the sum of the p-values or the density is one, right? It contains 100% or as a proportion one, right? But it contains 100% of what could happen. So the AUC or area under the curve equals one. So then when we look at specific spaces in the curve, so say we were to look only here, right, that would be a different value and it would have to, by definition, be less than one, right? So we can look at these different spaces and get ideas about the specific probabilities and that is part of the benefit of distribution. So we can say, okay, well, what, what's the probability of a score that's two standard deviations below the mean, which would be right here, right? Mu minus two, sigma. So this is two standard deviations below the mean. And we can say, well, what's the probability that you would score here or lower? And so basically we want to know this space under the curve, right? And so we know that's going to be some small value less than one, right? So the curve approaches, but never actually touches the x-axis. This is asymptotic behavior, right? Uh, asymptotes are lines that approach, but never touch a curve. So here, this curve never actually intersects the axis, which means that the probability never actually becomes zero, right? Because if you think the y-axis is a probability or density function, there is no point at which you actually intersect, right? So you never get to the point where y truly equals zero, or that's essentially that something is impossible would be a kind of colloquial way to think of it, right? Every normal distribution can be simply defined by stating that it is normally distributed, which is abbreviated a lot of times N or ND, right? But normally distributed with some mean and some standard deviation or variance, right? If it, you were going to put this as variance, you would put a square on it. Um, you'll see some people annotate with the mean and standard deviation and others with the mean and the variance. Either can be acceptable, right? Because the variance and the standard deviation are entirely related to one another, right? You just square the standard deviation to get the variance or just square root the variance to get the standard deviation. So you can define the normal distribution. I can say exactly what a distribution looks like if I know it is normal and I know it's mean and I know it's standard deviation, right? So we'll talk more about that and the most um, common form of the normal distribution, which is the standard normal distribution here in a moment.